two people who've joined us, I guess Mike joined us late yesterday and Dag has joined us this morning. I'd like them to briefly introduce themselves. Mike, would you go use the mic? Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> I'm embarrassed saying it. Well, this is embarrassing. I have to <laughs> turn the microphone There lower. you go. <laughs> They'll have to go up for Dag. So I'm Mike Humphreys. I've met a number of you yesterday. I'm uh, currently the chair of the Software Industry Special Interest Group. Bert and Luann had that position for the last 20 years, and fortunately, neither of them have really retired. Bert somehow put this whole conference together in his spare time. I had nothing to do with it, but I, uh, I think we're going to have some interesting conferences coming up. I've been involved for a little over 15 years. Bert and Luann drew me in when uh, we did a group meeting on timesharing, and I became really intrigued to find out that other than those of us that have been living in the computer software industry, which is how I spent mine, there was a lot of interesting stuff going on behind the scenes. So I became involved. It's been a pleasure working with them. They've set a really high standard, and we have some interesting meetings that are going to be coming up. Uh, some of you, I can see already that there might be some overlap on those, so you might get invitations to come and do some of those, and certainly the historians that are here as well. Thanks. Thank you, Mike. Dag, come say hi. You can, uh, you're tall enough, you don't need to do that. I can make it go up. Is this working? Hi, I'm Dag Spicer, senior curator at the museum. Um, been working here for 21 years or so. I'm an engineer, electrical engineer, and historian by, by training. Um, this is a wonderful group. It reminds me of the 76 conference at Los Alamos of, uh, of computer uh, pioneers. It's, we've got all the right people in the room. It's like a supernova of desktop publishing uh, people. So. I'm super excited to be here and to listen in on, on some of these legends uh, of whom you are all uh, part of that, of that group is uh, just amazing. So uh, thank you all again for coming and thank you Bert and David for organizing this wonderful conference. You're, are, are you the old, I won't say oldest in age, but the longest tenured employee here? The uh, Methuselah of the museum. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Dag is also active with the annals of the, of the history of computing and so forth. He's been involved in that for a lot of years as well. Okay, Th these sessions on the companies now um, focus on the company as a whole and where the technology directed things will pick that up. But fundamentally, we're trying to stay at them as a business. I have a sequence of questions I normally go with, but we'll see how the flow is. All of you pitch in. If you hear something or think of something, please do, because uh, it's, we want to involve everybody in all these things. Now, John and Chuck, you decide wh who's t who answers what. You can poke each other as you see fit. You were all at, you were both at Xerox Park, and you were not happy what you said yesterday that they weren't going to go ahead. Xerox is going to take seven years to do what you wanted to do. So you decide to leave. Tell me how you make the decision, who's involved in making it, and what were your concerns? What was your plan? All right. Again, whichever starts. So I'm going to talk about not only how we started the company, but sort of our philosophy and attitude about what kind of company we wanted us to be. Um, I met John uh, when I called him for a, a phone meeting because I was starting a new laboratory uh, in graphics and computer science. And I hope I'm not repeating myself from something I said yesterday, but at that lunch, uh, first thing I noticed is we both had beards. Uh, we both were still married to the same women we married originally. Uh, we both had three kids, two boys and a girl. Uh, we were both mathematicians, but the real kicker was we both refereed at AYSO soccer. <laughs> and uh, so I hired him. Best hiring decision I ever made. There was one other great hiring decision I made years before at Park, uh, a man by the name of Ed Taft, whose name has come up, probably one of the best programmers ever. At any rate, uh, John and I started working together. I uh, told you a little bit about this yesterday. We got to the point where we had done interpress, discovered that Xerox was probably never going to get it out into the marketplace, or at least not get it out in a way that it would have a chance of being coming in worldwide international standard for printing. So John and I 
sat down in my office and we decided, well, we could get old and gray and as I think John used the phrase, stay in the sandbox for the rest <laughs> of our lives. And it would be fun, but it isn't what an engineer dreams of. An engineer dreams of building something that millions of people will use. That's their ultimate goal. Uh, frankly, I don't think many engineers are motivated by money. They're motivated by having an impact. So uh, it turns out that John's thesis advisor, Dave Evans, happened to be on the board of Hambrick and Quist. And so he made an introduction and we went up to talk to Bill Hambrick. And what we told them we were thinking of doing is starting a company in which we would put together printers, excuse me, computers, laser printers for proofing, plate making equipment for making printing plates, and allow the Fortune 500 companies to bring all of their publishing production in-house. He loved that idea because he hated financial printers. <laughs> financial printers ripped him off. They were always late, and he just was not happy. So for that reason alone, he was, thought this would be a great idea. And what, he said, have it, you ever written John, a business plan? Wh wh when is this? Oh, this is 1982, summer of 1982. Thank you. Um, he said, have you ever written a business plan? I said, well, I've written lots of operating plans. He said, no, 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 a business plan. And I said, well, no, not really. I sort of knew what one was. He said, fine. I'll write a check for and hire a guy for you to work with you to write the business plan because I need that to go out and raise the money. So he hired this man, we worked together and in a few months we had a business plan. We had speculated about how much money it was going to take and did a little bit of guessing about what the opportunity was in terms of revenue and so forth. And uh, took the plan up to Bill in uh, San Francisco. He looked at it, he said, fine. Quit your jobs. And I looked at him and I said, Quit our jobs. <laughs> he said, Well, you got to do that. Well, so said, the original plan was to do it in the evening? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I went in and talked to my boss at Xerox, and he was okay. He was not thrilled, but at any rate, we uh, left. And um, as we were starting the company, we said, you know, we really want to build a company that we would like to work at. Because we felt if we build a business or a company like that, we could hire the kind of people who were sort of like us and that we could work with very effectively. And we didn't want to have a whole regimen of a whole bunch of rules and behavior and all that kind of stuff. We just wanted to make sure that people understood that honesty, and dependability and inventiveness were the key attributes. So as we began to hire people, we focused not on hiring the youngest, least expensive engineers, but people we had a relationship with, that we knew, that we trusted, that we felt could pretty much work on their own without a lot of micromanagement. And we began to build a team. In that process, before very long, you discover that there are a whole bunch of constituencies that you have to deal with. You have your employees and the people who manage them. Uh, you have your customers. You have the vendors who supply things for you. Uh, eventually, you have either your uh, investors or your shareholders. And you also have the communities in which you're operating. And the trick about that is that all of those constituencies are mildly in conflict with one another. <laughs> for what's good for one is not necessarily good for the other. And so they're all trying to pull you in a particular direction. And since we didn't want to write a manual of behavior, we said, let's make it simple. Let's make the Adobe way of doing business that you treat every one of those constituents the way you would want to be treated. And that's the Adobe way. Now, a lot of people say, well, that's a religious principle and it comes from Jesus Christ. <laughs> Actually, if you look at every religion that has ever been on this planet, somewhere in the beginnings, 
It has that principle. It's in the Koran. It's in the Jewish Bible. It, it's everywhere. But we wanted it to be the way our company was thought about. We also decided fairly early on that um, we wanted to make sure that we convinced the people who worked for us as they were beginning to hire people that they had a philosophy of hiring extremely talented people. And the catchphrase we used is you should always hire people who are smarter than you because it's a much bigger population from which to choose <laughs> your potential employees. And that has been our philosophy, and it has worked out extremely well as a company. We also felt that we wanted to pay attention to the communities very strongly, to the communities in which we operated, because we wanted to be welcomed as co-citizens. And so from the very beginning, we decided as we started to make a profit, that we would take a small percentage of our profits and that would be an annual charitable fund, which originally we had a group of employees run. Well, that fund now is quite large on an annual basis, and so we have to hire some people to manage it, but same philosophy, and it always will be part of our company. This came later, but we also decided that the environment was something that we needed to show some leadership in. And so we decided that we would upgrade our headquarters buildings in San, San Jose to Platinum LEED certified. And a lot of people said, oh, God, that's <coughs> going to be a lot of money or a waste. Turns out we did it, and it paid off in about two years. And we now sell power to PG&E. Uh, our urinals <laughs> have no water in them, so we save a lot of water. And today, roughly 50% of the Adobe employees around the world work in Platinum LEED certified buildings. We have the oldest Platinum LEED certified building in the country and perhaps the world up in San Francisco, an old brick warehouse that was built in um, the 1880s. And we upgraded all the way to Platinum LEED certified. And of all the people who work for Adobe, 75% work in buildings that have some LEED certification associated with it. And our employees love that. They're so proud of it. We probably have one of the lowest attrition rates in the industry, particularly of the people who are the outstanding performers. Our employees typically rank us in, at the very top of the companies that they like they like to work at, um, and uh, that's been something that's been extremely important to John and me, because we can look back now after roughly 35 years in business and say that we're very proud of not only what we've accomplished in our financial performance, but more importantly, in terms of the cultural uh, style in which we have done that and the way our company is respected. Um, and uh, I wrote myself one other note. Oh, and the other thing we decided from the very beginning is that printing and publishing, we knew, was a worldwide international business. And that it was critical that we demonstrate that our technology could be used everywhere. So we began in Europe. That's where we did the Mergenthaler deal to get a license to the type library and develop with them the first PostScript image setter. Uh, I think I mentioned yesterday that I went to Japan, couldn't get a deal with the number one printing company, but we did get a deal with the number two one. And all of a sudden, Jap Japanese all use PostScript for their printing. From China, the Far East, everywhere. Let me go back to the beginning a little bit, Chuck. Sure. You, you, how much money did you raise? Two and a half million dollars. How, how far did that carry you? That was to carry us for two years. We began, the first person who came to visit us from the outside was Gordon Bell, who was from DEC, who at the, when I knew him, was my 
a hardware professor at Carnegie Mellon, and we showed him what we were doing, and he looked at it, and he said, hmm, that's really pretty cool. He said, but I don't need computers, because I'm digital equipment. And I already got to deal with Rico for a printer, so I don't need that. But the group trying to get the software to get the computer to talk to the printer are getting nowhere. Why don't you sell me that software? And we said, ah, Gordon, we have this business plan. <laughs> And it raised us two and a half million dollars, and we have to do certain things. We can't do that. He said, well, I think you're nuts. <laughs> a couple months later, Bob Belleville brought Steve Jobs by. Steve looked at what we were doing. He said, I don't need a computer. I got this Macintosh. I don't need a printer. I got this deal with Canon. Sell me the company and come work for me, because I the software between the two isn't working. And we said, well, Steve, we don't want to work for you. <laughs> well, a very wise I'm decision. I'm sure we said it more positive. We did. But we said we wanted to start our own company. So, well, okay, that's fine. Sell me that software. And we said, Steve, we have this business plan. <laughs> he said, you guys are nuts. So we went and talked to the guy who Bill had put in as chairman, and he said, You're, Steve's right. You guys are nuts. Throw the damn plan out. It was just there to raise the money. And now you know what you're product is and who your customers are, go out and sell them. Who was the person? Who was the chairman? He was a crusty old guy from Nebraska who ran a valve manufacturing plant that was the only business in a small Nebraska town. And if he hadn't brought that company back to life, the town would have died. So he was a local hero, but he was a tough guy. What was his name? Q.T. Wiles. Q.T. Wiles. Wiles. I knew Q.T. <laughs> Thank and you very he much. He was uh, it's fairly far right of Barry Goldwater. <laughs> but one piece of advice that he gave John and me is, don't ever complain about taxes. If you're paying taxes, you're doing well. Which I thought was very refreshing. You never lose theory. money paying taxes. So right. how this is what the first six months or so this change transition takes place. Well, yes. Yes. And he, we went to him in the summer right after we talked Super to Steve. Bricks. And that's when he told us, uh, you know, call him up. So I called up Steve, and he said, what do you want for the company? I said, Steve, still not for sale. Okay, let's do a deal. And so we began negotiating, and he agreed to pay us 5% of the selling price of all of the laser printers that he could sell. Yeah, right. it was a good deal. In return, we had to write this software in mass ground. We had to help design the hardware, the hardware. that would run it, which we also did. And we put together this project, and we signed a contract right before the end of our fiscal year, which began on December 1st of each year. And so uh, he paid us a prepayment of $2 million, because uh, he wanted to make sure we stayed in business. <laughs> he bought 19.9% of the company for $2.5 million, which was five times what the original investors put in. So they already quintupled their money. Uh, and he did this, as I said, in our first fiscal year. So we, as a company, were profitable every Sorry. year. Your $2 million then, was that for the stock? Or was that? No, that was separate. That was a prepayment so what did he on pay for future the royalties. So what did he pay for the stock? Two and a half two million. And a half million. So you now had two and a half million from your investors. You had a $2 million advance, right. which you obviously put in deferred revenue. Right. So we had four and a half million dollars to work with. And you had another two and a half million that he bought stock to own that patient. Right. Okay. Yeah. So that was the deal. And um, we went off and started working. One uh, more question. How much of the stock did you guys have? What percentage? We each had 10% at the start. So 80% originally was owned by Hambrick and Quist of their investors? They owned 50%. The rest of it we retained for employees. Ah, so you had 20 plus 50 plus we you had 30%. 30 percent for employees. So when Steve bought, did he buy your, whose stock did he buy, the 20 percent? From the investors, I think. From the investors. We yes. still kept our 30 percent. That's what I was wondering. Okay. Keep and going. The investors were fine with that, except I got one negative phone call from one who said, now I have to pay taxes on my... <laughs> Isn't that terrible? <laughs> so Life is hard. So the way the accounting worked, the, the advance against royalties was non-refundable. So Adobe was profitable from the first year forever. That's why I asked about deferred revenue, because yeah. technically until you've performed, right. you can't claim that as revenue. 
Right, but they couldn't take it back. It was, <laughs> that's something different. That's yeah, cash. I understand that. <laughs> but in the first year, we had a demo. Uh, everything so was So what did you have at that point in time when you made these deals, what did you have working in the way of software? Uh, we essentially had the entire package sort of working, but it wasn't running in mass ground. It was running on a Sun workstation that was uh, hooked up to the Canon printer. How did you have it ready so soon? We hired really good engineers. <laughs> so you built from scratch. You didn't take That's right. any code. No, we did no. not. That was what I was trying to understand. Yeah. So within what, six so, months? So, uh, yeah, no, it was well, it was nine computer. months maybe. Yeah. Gestation and, and period, And there were right? bells and whistles <laughs> and pieces <laughs> that weren't done. But you had enough. That, that was what's so surprising. We interesting. had enough that we could print a letter on a sheet of paper. Wow, that's but, impressive. But the, the implementation of of PostScript, the basic engine, is relatively straightforward. To get it to perform to the level you need to is a much harder task. But to get a proof of concept, it's fairly straightforward. So, so that's what. Uh, back to, a little bit back to QT Wiles. Uh, the other advice he gave us is uh, know when to fire yourself. As you become, uh, you will make every decision in the beginning of the company. You will buy the furniture, you'll buy the artwork on the, on the wall, you will pick the color of carpet, you'll clean up, you'll do everything. And as you get bigger, be very careful how, be very careful that you delegate and very careful that you don't become sort of a monarch but become a manager. And, and that was a very good set of advice. That's like it. Just two or three more questions. Hold off, Donna. I'm going to cover these areas. Where, did you, where were your first facilities? Where did you set up the uh, operation? We had a teeny facility in Mountain View. Uh, it, it was 3,000 square feet. Uh, no. 1,700. 1,700 square feet. Then we added a little bit to it. Yeah. Uh, Liz came to work at that facility. Uh, One of your first employees? Yes, yes. Uh, we had uh, Steve McDonald, who was head of sales. We had Dan Putman, who was in an engineer. We had Doug Bratz. Tom Boynton. Tom Boynton. Uh, and um, ten people Bill, total? Bill Paxton. Bill Paxton. About ten people? Yeah, Linda Gass. How about Dick Sweet? Uh, by the end of the first year, uh, no, eventually, not yet. Right? Not, eventually. Yet. not eventually, yeah. Okay. And we event, uh, we uh, seventeen hundred square say. feet for ten people is not a lot of room. No, did there you have any? Did you have any equipment there, or were you using somebody else's equipment? We had at least a vax. We were time, yeah. We were time sharing the vax, and then uh, and when, when we hired an employee, we gave them a modem phone line and a terminal for their house because we wanted them to be, continue to have a family life <laughs> and we've done that for everybody and, and we, we borrowed hired. from DAC we borrowed from DAC a Rico printer yes but you yeah. had on premises what equipment uh, we a had sun. a printer and the vax and a sun, no it wasn't a sun workstation. sun workstation well we also had a sun workstation yeah. you had that in 1700 square feet <coughs> yeah come on we then moved very quickly to uh, on Embarcadero Avenue in Palo Alto, and there we had a lot more square feet. Yeah, and eventually took over the whole building. It's right across from the golf course at Embarcadero. You, once you made the deal with Apple and decided you were going to be software focused, is that a correct statement? Yes. So well, what did you see as your well, we, we were designing hardware, but we weren't going to manufacture it. Okay. You weren't going to build it. We, we were contemplating at that time also, this is a side note that never went anywhere, but we were also going to build a typesetter because at that time there wasn't a raster typesetter that was available until we discovered the Linotronic. 100. 100. So it was very important in our concept that we not only build a laser printer, but we also build the capability of driving a high-resolution typesetter. But your sales there through Apple were going to be their sales oh, where you got the, a piece. Yes. But you kept the rights to the software. Oh, yeah. It was and a now what did license. You that's my question. What did you intend to do with that? Who were you going to sell it to? 
we felt also very strongly that we wanted PostScript to become an open, uh, a universal standard used by everybody. So the marketing, we, our f very first contract was with a company out of uh, QMS. Out uh, of Alabama. Out of Alabama, and they made laser printers in the early days. So our very first rep, our very first implementation was on the QMS, and the QMS came out before the Apple laser writer. About two months before. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, they were an OEM, and, and Steve was trying to contact everybody. We were trying to sell Hewlett Packard. We were trying to sell IBM. We were trying to sell everybody who produced printers. What were you going to sell them? Licenses to the software. Same deal we did with Apple. And that's why I started to go into Japan and talking to NEC you were looking and Canon. And so you weren't trying to sell the use of the software directly, you were going to sell through OEMs or others. That's yeah. right. That's a very different model. That's what I was getting at. Yes. And then and and they were all licensing deals. So they licensed the software, they licensed the fonts, they licensed all of that stuff. No one else, nobody wanted an exclusive or you wouldn't give them? Oh, we wouldn't we're, give we're, them. We wouldn't give them. Oh, Steve wanted an exclusive. <laughs> of course. Uh, you no. wanted to buy the company. <laughs> And, but we said, no, you know, the thing is, the, the PostScript will become useful if it is a broadly accessible platform. You weren't selling, this is what's different about the model, you weren't selling to an end user. No. You were selling to basically All someone's going to produce a product. So we only had two salespeople for a long time. <sighs> only had 25 or 30 companies to talk to. So that's a terrifically different model than the, the soft, yeah. than the normal software company. And so we 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 called we we eventually had deals with Prime Computer, with Wang, with DAC, with IBM, I, eventually with HP I, and IBM, IBM uh, HP. Uh, so I think by 1987 we had name. Roughly 35 OEMs, and the business was was growing, doubling. And at that point, there were somewhere between 50 and 70 clone developers trying to compete with us. They were building an implementation of PostScript, and they wanted to undercut our price and sell to the same people we were trying to sell to. I want to come back to that. So when you speak of an OEM, they were really not just someone packaging other people's hardware and stuff. They were actually producers of printers. Is well, that they didn't statement? necessarily do the xerography, but they did the controller hardware, put it all together with our software and sold it they would sell the whole user product. Ah. By staffing, you started to grow. You had about 10 people, you said initially. End of the first year, do you remember? Do any of you have the numbers of how big no, you were? less than 15, I think. I, I actually, I'll give this to the computer museum, but we have all the annual reports. Right. And so we'll give you the annual reports that show the growth rates. Oh, I've got the timeline here. Let me, let me read, where is it? It's in this piece of paper somewhere. Do you guys ever get much more equipment of your own, Chuck? I mean, oh, yeah. Computer oh, equipment? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, tons. Yeah. Did you have your own, or did you license? Did you get it from? You weren't using a data center then. You were using your own equipment mainly. No, we 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 always ran our own equipment, and um, so we started as soon as we got the deal with Apple. We immediately started using Macintoshes. One more question for Chuck: Did you ever need more financing? No. No. Wow. So in course, nineteen. So two and a half million dollars is now worth seventy billion. <laughs> so anyway, in 19, so our revenue in 1986 was $16 million. One six or six zero? Oh? One six. In, let me get the next number here. Uh, 1990. 16, 39, 83, 129. <laughs> <laughs> the hell with the book, he knows it. <laughs> We went public in 1986 in the summer. Uh, we had a huge offering. It was for five and a half million dollars. <laughs> At all? Yes. What percentage did you sell off? 
Oh, I was small. Small, 10%. Ten less, ten, less than that. Less than that. It was, it you was, had a valuation about 55 mil. Yeah, we are market cap at 55. Yeah. D David has a question. Did the, did the availability of PostScript and the fonts, did that lower the barrier to entry essentially for other people to get into to essentially grow your customer base. That is to say, with the availability of PostScript, it would make it easier for me to contemplate, you know, introducing a laser printer of my own. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The hard part is the Because we did the hard part. So it really we did lower that barrier and grow that laser printing market Yeah, Canon, overall. Canon was competing with Schuster, Competing with Rico, competing with Fujitsu, you see? You know, all of the all of the printer manufacturers didn't have that component. Right. John, just for my edification, um, what was the deal you cut with all the other uh, OEMs during that kind of '86, '87? Same kind of deal. Did you would, did you do the same NRE or prepaid? Not NRE, but prepaid royalty, or by then you didn't need to do that because we did, uh, you were we cash flow we fine. Were, we were cash flow fine, uh, but the, the 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 reason we still did prepayments was to keep them serious. Right. 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 Yeah. Uh, then of your revenues. How much came from Apple and how much came from other during that period? I'd have to go back and look. Uh, Apple, Apple was a big chunk of it, but it was expanding. So QMS was not terribly large, but it was adequate. Deck it was like Apple's probably like, but that's why I was wondering how much was prepaid because the prepaid would get, get stuff going before actually any yes. sales really took place. Kind of that's sell right. through versus, because in my mind, it was by 88, it started to be where Apple's less than 50%, but, but prior to that, it was kind of the lion's share of what was yeah. being the, there. The, the interesting event is that when we were starting to become very, I mean, we were starting to sell to multiple typesetter companies, uh, with CompuGraphic and AutoLogic and all those guys. Uh, I did we ever do a deal with Monotype? They didn't have a raster, I don't think. Anyway, uh, so the business was growing and the number of licenses was growing. The big breakthrough was we worked about two years on IBM. And in 1986, IBM signed a license for PostScript. Um, that made Hewlett Packard Within a month, we signed Hewlett with Packard. Hewlett Packard <laughs> because once IBM signed, Hewlett Packard said, "Well, we sort of have to I'm sign." What, what group at IBM were you working with? Do you remember? Uh, out of Boulder, uh, the Boulder with the printer people. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, interesting difference. What about the font business? Uh, the font business, we started licensing. Oh, Liz can probably talk yeah, more talk, to talk that. Well, we we licensed the fonts. Uh, from Mercanthaler and ITC. Originally, the, li the licensing or the font fee that people were used to in the industry paying was so like $35 a face. And uh, we convinced them that that royalty <laughs> was, would not, uh, the volume of our opportunity was much higher than they had in the past. And so that fee was not acceptable. And we came. We down. negotiated. Good deal. A good deal. <laughs> How far down did you go? I can't. Oh I can't remember. A dollar. Dollar. Mm -hmm. One dollar. Uh, that's a, a that's good revenue negotiation. Revenue. I want her to negotiate I, for it, me it next time. It was not. Uh, uh, the font revenue was not significant. No, no. but the uh, it was important because we um, built into that first printer, that laser writer, those thirty-five faces. And you know we've always paid royalties for the use of those typefaces, and so that 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 was thirty five dollars. <laughs> so. Three three people who are waiting to talk. Tom, you were first. I think the general perception is that as laser printers became less expensive um, into the late eighties and the nineties, that PostScript became too expensive as a chunk of the overall cost to be viable on on lower end printers. So. 
do you think that's, that's true or is it just an excuse? And also, did you ever consider a different model where you would have gone for a larger percentage of the base well, and a lower and, cost? Well, and let, let, me, let me address that because it was, so 100% of Adobe's resources, 100% was devoted to OEMs and building the printer business. Uh, in the 86 time frame, we said, well, you know, we don't want to be a one product company. And so our first foray into the applications business was to selling fonts. So we started packaging extra fonts and selling those and trying to build a distribution channel, which was not terribly successful. Um, we also made the, uh, both Chuck and I made the decision that we had to, uh, we had to have new products. That w if we relied on PostScript, we were gonna be a one product company that wouldn't last. So we started the development of Illustrator at about 85 probably. Yeah, 85. Uh, and we set, took some of our very, very best engineers and we said, you are not allowed to work on PostScript, <laughs> period. No exceptions, no matter what kind of fire drills they have. So we, we were working also on Display Pro Script at the same time, but we started working on Illustrator and I think it was in 86 or so that we demoed off the, our printer some of the very first Illustrator images and uh, we announced it in 87, I believe. 88. 88, no. Yeah, it was no. 88. It was 88. On the timeline somewhere. Keep going. Keep talking. Okay. Anyway, we'll come back later. Okay. Uh, but then we 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 founded what we would call the applications division, and building. We we thought people would cl very quickly understand the value of Illustrator, but the applications division grew rather slowly. But more and more resources went into it. And we started acquiring some other products, and a lot of them weren't terribly effective. Uh, but it, but one was <laughs> what? Oh, Illustrator. Or? Photoshop. Photoshop. Oh, yes. Photoshop. Well, that was 1989. So, in, in 1989, the Knowles brothers came in, and they demoed this. <laughs> they, they demoed this photo. They came out of industrial light magic and they demoed on a Macintosh with 512K memory with this little teeny black and white screen. They demoed this photographic product that they had developed. And industrial light and magic wasn't interested in commercializing it. And so they, they had been shopping it around. They shopped it around to Apple. They shopped it around to us. And you have to remember that that Macintosh was a black and white bitmap display. There were no scanners in the world that were commercially available. Well, they were, but they were the size of the Yeah, they were Cytex machines and things like that. So they were very, very high end. The maximum hard drive you could buy for a Mac at that time was 20 megabytes. Okay, no memory. Uh, I. I made a leap of faith and said, we're gonna license this because memory's gonna get cheaper, machines are gonna get bigger, eventually digital cameras, there were no digital cameras. Digital cameras would come along and so they started building Photoshop for the Mac and re-architecting it so it could be ported. Um, but it was, a, I, I said maybe we'll sell 200 copies a year. You consider Photoshop part of the desktop publishing world? Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, tell me why. Well, because photographs are a part of our life. Right. So and, and, and I was firmly believed. This book has text, graphics, and photographs. I firmly believed that the digital cameras were coming and that film was going to go away. I used to go to Kodak regular basis and described to them the fact that those little yellow boxes were going to become obsolete. And they said, no, 
No, no, film they're... will be forever <laughs> what people want for the high quality output. Then I'd go over <clears throat> to Japan and talk to Fuji, who's the number two supplier of film. And they listened and they listened and they said, ah, oh, Chuck-san, we understand. And they started building digital cameras. Early, so, I didn't realize it was that early. Yes. That was in the early 90s. Very, well, Apple very came out with a sort of mini, sort of weak digital camera, but, but useful. Uh, and, and Photoshop, uh, what we didn't appreciate and what we didn't foresee, even though we knew that this was going to eventually happen, we did not anticipate the memory explosion at the pace that it exploded. I mean, the fact that the prices of memory came down and the prices of digital cameras came down and everything. And the cool thing about Photoshop was that the Knowles brothers, because they worked at Industrial Light and Magic, they had architected it where it had an absolutely superb virtual memory management system so they could deal with large images. Are you licensed or did you buy the... the we licensed it. Paid them a royalty. We paid them a royalty. And continued to. And, well, no. No. <coughs> the Knowles brothers, <laughs> the Knowles brothers, I'll tell you the story. The Knowles brothers were getting millions of dollars, okay, for the licensing of, of Photoshop. In, in 2003, they thought, gee, this is, this is going to taper off and we're not going to, we're not going to, do this, and so Bruce Chisholm, who was a CEO at that time, bought it for $65 million, which was the best deal <laughs> ever made. We're going to get to acquisitions and other ones in a minute. <laughs> but, it, but wait, wait, wait. We, go ahead, Tom. We, we got there when I asked about uh, postscript licensing costs. What, did you go in that direction because you needed the revenues from postscript to underwrite those other developments? Well, we d P postscript was our main source of revenue, but we didn't want to be a uh, postscript. Oh yeah, 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 right. We, you, companies don't succeed on one product. I'm sorry. You, you have to diversify. You have to invent all the time. I mean, continuously invent. And if you don't do that, if you don't reinvent yourself as a company, I mean, you know, Microsoft never going to live forever on Windows. I mean, you know, they have to diversify. In the technology business, you have to move with the technology. One of the interesting things we always said, though, was that many of the companies in the software business, the worst thing that could happen to them was to be successful with their first product, because then they thought they knew what the hell they were doing. Yes. <laughs> and most of them never got a second product out the door. And, and it's very tempting, because we were growing we at 100% in the postscript business. I mean, it was... It, Every brain cycle went into PostScript. So and the people in sales and marketing and the PostScript side of our business kept complaining continuously to John and me about why were we spending money on this barely profitable applications, applications business. <laughs> and that's the job and leadership that you have to have if you're going to be successful. You have to tell them, hell no, we're going to mm -hmm. do this because it's the right thing to do for the company. I would have thought it would have been crystal clear that PostScript is a wasting asset. I mean, other, the 70 clones, most of them were probably crap initially, but say, <laughs> some of them would get better and the price is bound to go down. And Actually, even if the volume goes up. That would have been, that was the scariest that thing. That seemed kind of obvious. You said that wasn't clear to your PostScript well, side it of the wasn't, house. It, no, and even it if also, it was clear to you. It was clear to us, but it wasn't particularly clear to the board of directors. Uh, mm. They push back on the applications business. We didn't make money in the applications business until, what, 2000 or something? Or oh, no, we made money in the mid-90s. <laughs> mid not in the mid-90s. Yes, we did. Well, mid -90s. <laughs> <laughs> we, can, we can look so, all of yeah, this sounds stuff. Sounds like you've gone over this territory a few times. <laughs> so, but, the, but the thing is, is that uh, you have to continuously look at the future Obviously. and you have to invest in it. The, the most telling of these stories is the Acrobat story. Mm. So in 1991 or 90, the machines were getting to be capable, 
okay, the CPUs were getting faster, the displays were getting good, color was becoming a reality of life, bit larger displays were good. And we had taken uh, the postscript code and we had ported it to the next machine. And so we had it operating on sort of on the computers. Uh, and the rendering of PostScript was getting faster and, excuse me, the rendering of PostScript was getting faster and faster and faster and the image quality was getting better. We had announced ATM, which solved the font problem for the screen. And so we could render documents on the screen in, out of PostScript relatively rapidly. Now what, and, and People approached me and said, well, why isn't PostScript an interchange machine where you send PostScript files around? And people were starting to send PostScript files around WAN networks and local area networks. Mm. It's basically a bad idea to have a programming language as a carrier around a network. <laughs> That's would you agree with that? <laughs> totally. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay as long as it's sufficiently circumscribed. Yes, but... PostScript is not circumscribed. So it, it, that's a bad idea. So, and the other thing is, is if you want to ship a document around, you really want to have page independence in the representation. So the trick that I described yesterday, where you can change PostScript to flatten out the display list so that it is totally linear, pages are independent, it has no programming interface whatsoever is really a cool representation because every PostScript file can get turned into a PDF file. So we hired, we had two engineers who were, I would call them quick and dirty programmers, uh, build a proof of concept. And they built the first implementation and we started showing it to people. In the early 90s, nobody got it. <laughs> they just didn't understand. You would show somebody and they'd say, well, what would I use this for? Why do I want to do this? Send a document around a network. What, an, what a dumb idea. <laughs> and and we've talked to, we talked to all the consulting people and the consulting people say, well, why don't you send Word files? Or why don't you send Lotus 123 files? Or why don't you send the, the various application files? Well." they sort of weren't realistic because there were no implementations across platforms that worked with a DAM. I mean, even Word files didn't really work very well across, across platforms. So, so can I ask, you might have tried the TAC, uh, do you use interoffice mail? Yes. yes, we do. <laughs> Don't you think it would be nice to have computer? Presumably you tried that and it didn't work. No, no, people didn't understand it. That's really I interesting. It, it, Mind boggle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we announced, so we, so then I said, okay, first of all, this quick and dirty implementation is not going to, not going to fly. So we got Peter Hibbard, Richard Cohn, and Ed Taft, Ed Taft to architect what the PDF file architecture was. So these guys, I said, here's, here's the property. The thing has to be extensible. It has to be architecturally really sound and robust. It has to be handle all media types. You have to be able to, you know, eventually carve it apart and do more things with it. And so you, this thing has to be extensible from a file architecture point of view. And from the point of view that you can get to any page instantly and render it instantly. So they built the spec for the PDF and they implemented completely separate team, not the first team that did it, but completely separate team, built by our best architects. We announced in 93. June of 93. 93 was the announcement. Of, of PDF. And it took off very, very slowly. Say so we introduced it to a big yawn. A big <laughs> yawn. And then in, well, and, and the board actually thought we ought to kill it. 
Talk about the, what the business model was for post for Acrobat. Well, originally we were going to we, yes. Well, we when we started out we were charging for the reader and we within microseconds si decided that that was a bad idea. <laughs> okay, that was a bad idea. So we made the reader free. Okay, but all yeah. of the all of the all right. software that produced it, PageMaker, everything else, we made money off of, but the reader was free. It seems to me when you were selling it to us, the, one of the big advantages was uh, what you do with fonts. Yes, you could subset fonts and the fonts traveled. And uh, with the document. Let's keep staying a little bit uh, earlier, Stan. Um, Tom, do you have another question on that or can we move ahead? And Dave? We got so much to cover. I'm, yes, I'm, well, I'm getting the, very, the, very. The, 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 you guys went to too damn many business. What you called an application? What did you mean by an application? You mean uh, we, you well, use the term that you went oh, from Photoshop is an application, Illustrator is an application, PageMaker is an application, FrameMaker is an application. In all those cases, you're selling the software, though. That's right. Standalone. That's right. Not like your model where you built in. We're licensing. Well, well no, no, of course. Yeah. But in the applications business, we were selling the. You, you were licensing the the use of the software, that's right. but to an end user, that's right. not and to someone, uh, not to Noel Young. I'm sorry, Users go ahead, thought Chuck. they were buying the software. I know they thought. That. <laughs> Just as they do for any other application. How were you licensing it? Well, you buy a package for Photoshop, and that's a license to use that package. And is that a one-time thing? Is there an it, annual? It thing? was a one-time thing. And then, just and, like everyone else's and then everybody else's. But then, just a few years ago, we switched the model to a subscription model. So I was wondering, so you did make that change, but that was in the we 2000s. We were one of the very first mm -hmm. companies to make that change, and we had enough of a control over the graphic arts industry where we could do it. Do you look at any of the other software companies in terms of how they priced their? Initial offering and their and their maintenance support yeah, constantly. Yeah, not just your competitors. I mean, in other in other other areas entirely. Yeah. So you studied Oracle's maintenance strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Probably <laughs> <Because> <laughs> and, and we dismissed it. <laughs> <laughs> what? Yeah. Well, and Quark and everybody else. I, I guess my point is, and most of the software companies had an initial licensing fee. And then an annual maintenance fee that was running about 15 percent. Not, 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 not in this world. No, they didn't. Some not, of the others. Not in this world. Not the in this PC world. world no one the PC, they didn't. Okay, so you, you considered this a PC license? It was. All it was a PC license. It wasn't considered. A PC Only ran license. on two operating systems. Oh really? Mac Apple and, Win and Windows. Interesting. Wonderful. It's a completely different universe from the one you came out of. Of course. No, I ended up with clients doing this work, and we were selling, we were licensing the things in the software. But that was one of the things that the models, the pricing models, were so different when we moved from mainframe to the, mid, the, uh, the minis and then down to the others. A very different so, model. So back to the story. Acrobat, when it was announced, was really useful on white area networks and local area networks for within corporations and within industrial settings. And it had a lot of appeal there. In 1994, the internet exploded. Okay, it sort of went whoop like that. Well, it turns out that it's, people do understand that it's really useful to be able to store documents on the internet and to pass them around and to ship them with email and do all of those things. And this was, this was the thing that just sort of flipped the switch. If we look at the year 2000, let me use that a break point. What was the, what were your principal revenue sources at that point in time? The year 2000? I'm just using that as a break point, yeah. Uh, Acrobat. Acrobat. Our, our applications. Photoshop. Postscript was probably, what, uh, probably a $300 million business? No, it only got to $200 million. $200 million. Well, your starter thing that justified what? the company was no longer what was carrying the company. Oh, later. no. Yeah, the application. That's almost business. always true. Yeah, 
I mean, look at Microsoft. Basic was what got it started. It certainly wasn't what was carrying it even 10 years later. So, so the, the massive amount of, of revenue was really the applications business. But then later on, uh, we diversified, reinvented the company again. That was and where I was going. Let me ask a couple of different questions. Management. The two of you sort of were co-managers of the thing. Yes. Did you split your roles? Were you technology, you business, or vice versa? Mostly. I, I mean, we, we both participated in all aspects you of didn't, it. You didn't we bifurcate. Did, but over time, I did a lot more of the traveling internationally and selling and marketing uh, there. John tended to stay more focused on technology and, and things of that kind. But we both were interchangeable. Which was meant, you know, we could lead a natural, a normal life. So now you bring in other management. You're bringing in operations management and so forth to help you, I assume. Yes. Oh, yeah. When? Well, but there were other, there were other principles that were going on. Uh, the other thing is, other than treat people the way you would like to be treated, uh, we have always hated political infrastructures. In other words, it was very important that every group were, was transparent, communicated, that people traded ideas and technologies, that there never became no power fiefdoms. And I, uh, we, hired, <laughs> we hired a set of managers, uh, and they all thought we were going to retire, and they all took their jobs believing that they were probably going to be the next CEO or something. So we had a head of finance, we had a head of marketing, we had a head of products, we had head of sales. Service. Uh, so my, that, Service you know, and support? No, there was one, oh, who was the fifth? The product, I, well, no, you already said that. Let's see, Pardon David. CF, CFO. Head of marketing, uh, head of sales, head and of head products. of products. Yeah. Five. And in 1998, uh, uh, the company started to stagnate badly. It was um, it was not uh, the the growth rate had almost disappeared in the application, but it hadn't gone down. I mean, it was still growing. The stock was okay, but the stock was sort of suffering. Um, and we had a set of five senior executives that just didn't work together. They were constantly making power They centers. were undercutting one another. They were undercutting one another. They weren't communicating. Nobody was acting as a team. And the, co and the company was clearly suffering because of it. I mean, it was just, the atmosphere was toxic. Uh, Chuck and I <laughs> met, uh, yeah, I think it was in July? August. August. Uh, and we sat down and we said, what are we going to do about this? So we went down through the senior executives and said, is there anybody we can fire that will fix the situation? Is there any bad guy in the months if we fire him? Um, and we concluded there wasn't, so we fired them all. We fired the entire executive staff in the fall of 1998. And we went in front of the company. And then we did what we should have done from the beginning. We really began grooming a specific individual that we want, who had been with the company for five, six years, and give him the chance to develop and grow so that he could become the next CEO. So in other words, the original five, you had all gotten from outside. Right. Yes. They weren't internally, uh, yes. and then you decided to go to internal growth. That's and right. You, and bad idea it failed, was. I can obviously see. <laughs> <laughs> well, it did. But the other thing we did is we changed the attitude towards the street. We had never, we had never, forecasted any revenues 
in any quarter ever. We were incredibly conservative about what we did. So uh, I got up in front of uh, the financial group and, and we worked this out with Bruce Chisholm who had taken over products and we said, okay, here's gonna be our revenue growth over the next year. And we're going to, we are going to put those stakes in the ground and we're gonna hit every one of them. And <laughs> this is high risk business. Uh, so we step, step out in the ground, we set down a plan and we hit every number. But then <clears throat> we got a either piece of mail or phone call, I don't exactly remember, from a company called Quark. <laughs> They saw what had happened. Our stock had taken a tremendous hit because in addition to all the internal management problems, for some reason Japan had a horrific quarter and they were about 20% of our business. And so our stock tumbled badly. And so our friends at Quark said, we'd like to do a tender offer and take you over. <laughs> and <coughs> I don't know how many of you, are, well, I'm sure that most of you in this room have dealt with Quark. They're a um, somewhat belligerent company, I guess is the polite way to put it. And Paul can speak to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there was no way we were going to let this happen. And so Our in addition to what John had done initially, <laughs> I went out on the street and I talked to every major shareholder and I explained, this is how we're going to fix this. There's no way you should be even thinking about the possibility of letting this company take us over. And we had from people that uh, came with part of the Aldous acquisition, a development group up in Seattle who was working on a whole new way to think about how to do page layout. And we said, okay, we normally never compete with another company directly. We do our own thing and it's always new. Here's a case where maybe we need to compete. And so within a year at a <clears throat> Apple conference, we introduced InDesign. And before long, we had the lion's share of that business. So it was, uh, th that was a, a painful time. It sounds like a very difficult period it you was. went through. Did it affect you personally in terms of how you emotionally uh, confidence in yourself, that sort of thing? I, I think it brought out the uh, vicious tiger in me. So I was not gonna have this. And personally, I was not gonna let the likes of Quark take over and we were not gonna fail. So you, you really I was a lion, he was a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> you really went through then a takeover, a hostile takeover battle then? Yes. Because uh, I was involved with Sterling Software when they took over informatics. Uh, they were both my clients, and that was the first hostile takeover. This was 1982 or so in the industry. And, uh, Sterling won. They were one, uh, what, one eighth the size of informatics, but it was a fast. They did not do what you were capable of doing. Apparently, the investors had enough confidence in you to back you instead of forcing you to sell. Well, they were, uh, they were, I mean, because we lived, put the stakes in the ground, because we said, here's how we are going to execute, they had had enough track confident record track it. record with us where they said, okay. And we essentially hit all the milestones and profit targets and the stock recovered and uh, we, and we had developed the infrastructure to build applications that was really a machine. You had a question? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I would just like to hear a little bit more about the story of InDesign. Was it all developed in-house? Yes. Anything else you could share that was memorable about doing that? How big a team was working on it? How long did it take? It was the ex-PageMaker team and the researchers. Uh, we merged, after acquiring all this, we we merged those programs so that they used Cortec. They used all the imaging models internal to Adobe. And they used their object level 
concept of documents and they were really good engineers and so they built a really extensive infrastructure for in design that was really bold good product on i have a, f I have a few real, real quick questions first of all uh, why did you name the company adobe <laughs> <laughs> we currently every name we applied for, somebody already had. California, oh. it's really tough. <laughs> oh, I see. And so one day I was at home and I noticed my wife was looking up at some directions, and there was a map of Los Altos sitting there, and I remembered that at, at, at Park we had always, when we named a new project, we'd throw it literally a dart at the wall where there was a map of California, and whatever it came close to was the name of the project. <laughs> and so I said, boy, that creek goes nearby John's house, wasn't too far from our house, Adobe Creek. Adobe system. Adobe. Thanks. And the other thing, this morning as I came here, I passed by your, your old office, uh, which is now Google, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and in front of it is this, uh, I don't know, <laughs> thinking man or something like this, uh, the, the, this, this, this sculpture. Is it true that you had something to do with that? Nope. Oh. It came with the building. Oh, I'm, I, I'm sorry. I thought it was your, and, the building, I, I, and the building is a teeny part of Google. Oh, oh no, I, I, I had heard, that, I had heard that, that you commissioned that one. Okay. Yeah. No. Um, uh, okay, now, um, you mentioned Ed Taft. Okay, I, I was just wondering how much uh, uh, actual programming you, you ever did after founding the company instead of instead of managing did did, did you did you did you keep your hand in at all in, in the looking looking at code for, and how long did that last? I I've always programmed but I've never at Adobe I didn't directly participate in programming it's I was the C programmer and I was one of the half dozen people working on the implementation and my job was to do the font cache because you couldn't generate the characters on the fly and maintain performance. Huh? You had to remember the characters that you had already scanned, converted, and uh, set up a cache memory for them. So you wrote that in C? I, yes. And does that code still survive? I think it probably does. So okay. I, uh, I wrote all of the test programs for PostScript. In other words, all the PostScript code that would test the PostScript engine. I'm, I'm more time, but not. But then, it, it seems to me one of the one of the key things that happened that hadn't been mentioned yet is it, is the it, is the graphic arts industry as opposed to pr the printing industry w w where you developed a really solid reputation among the designers, the artists themselves. I mean, this was I mean, in order to make Illustrator work, this was this was something that 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 became part of of every graphic artist's education. And so uh, I, I know at some point you hired Russell Brown, who had a lot of. We uh, hired, we hired had a him. A lot, 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 lot of, a lot of, you know, uh, uh, <coughs> credibility. In that. And, and so, can you describe something about that? that go, in other words, going into the art world and building a reputation it, 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 uh, among the top designers of the uh, of, of, of the industry that, that must. The basic architecture of of Illustrator was a combination of me and Michael Schuster. Mike Schuster was the programmer Schuster, yeah. and uh, well, but the there was a, wasn't there a Steve Schiller? Steve Schiller. Schiller, okay. Yes. Okay. Uh, the team's gotten okay. much larger over the years but the very first one uh, it was essentially under my guidance that, that Mike Schuster built the code uh, for Illustrator. Uh, so that's, uh, it was sort of under the direction from an architecture point of view that the Acrobat code was built. But Ed Taft and, and Peter Hibbard were the ones who were really down in the, and Richard Cohn were the ones down in the dirt. Oh, by the way, Acrobat is Adobe's single largest product in terms of revenue. Uh, one of the, the points um, that Don's trying to make is that how do we uh, succeed in getting this the application into the graphic arts world in the hands and by and we 
we had hired originally some very talented, very talented uh, graphic artists, and they adopted the tools very quickly. And one of the things we did is we uh, went out to show everybody what we were doing. And, and so, for example, I said, if you can win every <laughs> composition award or whatever, mm -hmm. I'll pay for an entry. Uh, so get out there and show them what we can do. And, and we've so gotten awards from RIT and all of the graphic of arts schools. So we just, we just put ourselves out there and having to show people what the quality could be done in typography and in graphic design. Well, what, was the competition? what was the competition for Illustrator? Uh, just Corel Draw for a while, but not really. That's what I thought. Again, time is becoming a okay. factor here. No, I have. We have three uh, people who have started before that. K Hanson, you had. You were first. Hi. So um, I have two questions. My first one is about um, the consolidation in the um, creative content gra uh, applications industry. Um, so you know, <clears throat> talk about the um, acquisition of Aldis and the acquisition of Macromedia. Um, and my second question has to do with the transition um, on the Macintosh from the classic operating system to OS X, both from, from the perspective of um, core graphics or quartz being based on PDF, um, and also uh, the tasks that you had porting your application suite from classic to OS X to the carbon native. I'll take that question. It became very clear when after we built Illustrator, we built it for the Mac and we didn't build it for the Windows because Windows didn't have enough address space to do it effectively. Uh, so, but we knew that in spite of the desires of Steve Jobs, that we wanted all of our applications to run on as many platforms as was practical. So very, very early in the building of Illustrator, and the building of all of our software, we built a layer called core, core, core technology. And the core technology layer is essentially the thing that takes the interface between our applications and that core technology then interfaces to the operating system. So we abstracted out the operating system so that when we build a piece of code in an application like Photoshop, it interfaces to core technology and core technology takes the job of interfacing to the various operating systems. So there aren't multiple teams that are building the Mac version and building the Photoshop version or you know the PC version. Uh, that saves a huge amount of work. So so all of the font technology and all of the graphics technology and all of that stuff sort of live in part of core technology. There was also another thing we did. We unified all of the user interfaces. So there's a basic philosophy in PageMaker and in Illustrator and in Photoshop of how you do a user interface and all of those are essentially the same and they've been rationalized over the versions that we've implemented. That also saves a ton of money. It also saves a lot of hassle for the users because the users have consistent user interfaces. Um, as we get into the cloud, we're abstracting the clouds out so that we can use Amazon clouds or Microsoft clouds or anybody's clouds and have basic system software that will interface to any of them because the economics in the cloud world change. And it's again, we're getting into the 2000s, not the 1990s anymore. Yes, yeah, no, but, but the, the whole idea is that in the software business, applications don't stand alone. You could go, uh, again, time is a thing here, and I know we have other questions. Your acquisitions, can you describe, we will, uh, whichever one, I think, let's, let, do, don't tell Alice. Tell some other story of acquisition. <laughs> <laughs> All this was great, by the way. Yeah, I know. We'll, we'll get to that when we talk. Paul can talk about yes, that. Yes, we'll work from this okay, side. Okay, so, uh, so... What was your next biggest acquisition? Well, we've done a lot of them. There were a lot of little ones. And, but back in the 1990s. Macromedia. Macromedia and Omnichannel. 
Well, I'm not sure. Well, those are 2000, so macro. When's something before 2000? Oh. A lot of little companies, I actually have a list here somewhere. Take any one as a, as a guinea pig. How did you find them? What did you do? What kind of deal did you cut? Make it brief. Uh, we just acquired the company and acquired the software and then integrated into the mix. I mean, did you buy we would the company? see these people show up at the Siebel conference and start showing what they were doing, and if it looked interesting and related to what we were doing, we'd get to know them better and make a decision. Yeah. Did you buy the company or license the uh, software? Uh, mostly bought the company. Mostly bought the company. We hired the people, gave them stock, and... Uh, did you use an M&A firm? Oh, yes. uh, yeah, a variety. Who? Mostly Fred Quattron. I didn't hear. Frank Quatrone was the primary one, but not and the only one. You didn't use Broadview, who was the primary one in this in the software company business. Interesting. Oh, A whole different pattern here. here. How? What did so you do? The, what kind of deals did you cut? You were given cash, stock. How did you cut the deals? Some of both. Some of both, but mostly cash. Did you mostly keep the people who were running the company? For a for period, period. period of time. Most yeah. of most CEOs don't like to work for other people, so they wondering. go somewhere else. So but they, but the really talented engineers, we made sure they got very good stock options, and that's what kept them staying because the well, options bought, don't you bought a company with 20 people, how many did you keep on? Most of, most of them. Well, you wouldn't keep on the accounting people and the other? No, uh, no. Those Unless people. there was a fit. Unless there was a fit. Okay. Um, you had a question. You were next in line. Oh. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, ask how you feel about Flash. Uh, we have obviously enormously mixed feelings about <laughs> Flash. Uh, uh, Flash came with Macromedia. Uh, Flash was never architected to be on the internet. Uh, and that's its major problem, but it also doesn't it, it, it doesn't justify doing a complete rewrite. Right. Which because security is, is not important. Uh, <laughs> well, we would we would just uh, we hope that over time it probably disappears. Flash, flash. What will it be replaced by? Uh huh. Well, there's. Uh, I mean, machines are getting faster. Animation software is getting better. I mean, you know, there are all kinds of things. I just is that a significant revenue producer? What is that a significant revenue no. producer? No, it never was. Never was. Right. And the reason Steve was so upset had nothing to do really with the technology. It had to do with the fact that he wanted everything that went through the App Store to be fundamentally oh, yes. Apple. Yeah, that's, a, that, that's an important story. A Apple, with the phones, wanted all applications to get, to get a tax on them, to go through the App Store. What year are we talking about? We're talking about the applications on phones. So date? 2006, six, seven. Yeah. Not history. I was told it has to be 15 years old before it becomes history. It's a good Go story, ahead with though. your story. <laughs> anyway, the story is that, that, that with Flash, you could, you could get onto an iPhone without going through the App Store. <laughs> That's, and that was economically a pariah to Steve. I'm not going to go not there. Happy. <laughs> not happy. We don't have time. Um, you have then you retired or changed your roles from being the active management of the thing to being on the board or chair of the board. When did that happen? Uh, we, I, me in 2003, Chuck in 2002. During the whole period we were talking about, you were still actively managing yes. and running the company. Absolutely. John if I had the time, we would go the rest of the distance, but we just <laughs> don't have it here with, yeah. uh, with the others. John and I always paid ourselves the same. We got the same stock options. There was never any reason for a division between the two of us. And so that not, was important. Certainly. And they have that many years, what, 40 years you've been working together now almost? Yes. yes. I think we disagreed it was 39. <laughs> so, <Yeah>. yes, <laughs> 39. But, but, which uh, counted. And that's a tremendous uh, relationship. Never parted company at the end of a day of work in anger. One of the interesting <laughs> comparisons, <laughs> you had such strong. What? Is that funny? <laughs> you, you had such strong principles. 
and they seem to have dominated a great deal of how you ran the company, in terms of the people, how you treated the environmental things and so forth. The only other company that's I know of that was like that was SAS with uh, Mr. Goodnight. You familiar with him? Huh? Interesting. <laughs> And he has a company with very much the same kind of principles, except he's a dictator, which you guys weren't. Uh, no. <laughs> we're, we're not that. Terrific. They were never public, were they? No, no, no. Never go public. We're going to have much more story to tell, but we have to break off here. It's 12 o'clock.